Please do not teach students pointless acronyms. Got it. The history of the internet all started with a government project called ARPANET. As it developed, it was eventually commercialized. When it evolved, it became the International Network, or the internet for short. This is what you're connected to right now. You are a part of the biggest network in the world. Soon after commercialization in various countries, companies called Internet Service Providers, or ISPs, were the most common way to get connected to the internet, linking everybody together. We're all connected through giant infrastructures, satellites in space, or underwater submarines connecting our countries together. From the backbones to the ISPs to you, networks exist either as LANs or WANs. Local area networks, or LANs, are like your home or even a small office, upward to geographical networks called wide area networks, or WANs. These could be cities, campuses, buildings, or just large networks. When you connect to a network, you get something called an IP address. It might look like this, like this, or this, or anything. But the most common addresses you'll see in a LAN network will probably look like this. When connected, you'll gain an IP address to identify yourself in the network. If you're trying to send something in the network, you send what is called a packet. A packet has an IP address to route where it needs to go, and that packet itself needs to be sent to the router, or the default gateway. The default gateway will usually have the first IP address in the network, if you check your IP configuration with this command, you can see the default gateway in there. And then you have your administrators. Administrators can do whatever they want. They have the credentials, they have the power, and it's a power that you need to assign very carefully. Because of their powers, you want to have your administrators live by a higher standard. That means longer passwords, more frequent password changes, and making sure they authenticate over and over and over again. When we restrict users, we do it because we need to implement the principle of least privilege. The principle of least privilege is making sure that everyone gets what they need. With them getting the necessities, you can reduce your attack. Layer 2, the data link layer, is more logical than the physical layer. This is where frames exist. Frames have a source and destination media access control address, known as a MAC address. These are used to route traffic on its own level. A device gets its MAC address from its network interface controller, known as a NIC. At this layer, instead of the computer being identified with an IP address, they're using frames and MAC addresses. Keep in mind that the frames can hold packets which operate on a higher layer. It's usually the payload in the frame that is unpacked once it communicates with a higher layer. At this layer, a piece of networking hardware called switches operate. They're like hubs, but they're not dumb and they won't send everything through every port. They send things where they need to go based on the MAC address. This itself is called switching. Switches can be configured for security or efficiency on a logical level. Layer 3, the networking layer, is where packets work and are sent around the internet. This is where routing is done, and you guessed it, this is where routers work. Routers will route packets to the IP address where they are addressed to. There are two different kinds of IP addresses, internal and external. Internal IP addresses are used within your LAN or WAN, usually assigned based on what is called a subnet mask. An external IP address is how you are represented on the internet. Every LAN or WAN is usually represented by one or more external addresses. Layer 4, the transport layer, deals with traffic control and communication between two hosts. The two big terms here are TCP and UDP. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. When something is transferred with TCP, it will verify that the host exists in the packets in the order that it's supposed to be sent in, and in the event that the data is lost or damaged on the way to the destination, TCP will correct it and request the packet that was lost. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. UDP is a low latency connection that can tolerate loss. Packets sent with UDP are sent regardless if the host exists or not, might not be sent in order, and it will not recover packets like TCP if they are lost or damaged. Just keep in mind, TCP is reliable and should be used for accuracy-sensitive data, while UDP is great for low-latency activities like voice, video streaming, or gaming. Both TCP and UDP have 65,535 ports. Browsing the web is for port 80, downloading files is for 20 and 21, 
and secure web accesses for port 443. Layer 5, the session layer, is used to manage sessions between two connections. Its primary purpose is to open, close, and manage the connection between two different hosts. Layer 6, the presentation layer, deals with converting raw data, encrypting, decrypting, compressing, decompressing, and translating data into a viewable format. These layers can be used to form examples or assist in going down a chain to properly troubleshoot any issues that you might run into. It's important to understand how these layers work together. I say FTP a lot because it is a protocol for file transfers. Protocols are a set of standards for certain services that they need to follow. As an example, any kind of web server needs to use HTTP or HTTPS as its protocol when users are attempting to access it. The first protocol we're going to be talking about is HTTP and HTTPS. These protocols are what web browsers use to explore the web. They stand for Hypertext Transmission Protocol. The one with the S at the end just means secure. HTTP will use port 80. HTTPS will use port 443. Both of them can use either TCP or UDP. Domain Name Service, or DNS, runs on both TCP and UDP ports 53. When you connect to a website, say youtube.com, instead of using an IP address, you simply type www.youtube.com. Whenever this happens, you're using DNS to translate that domain name into an IP address for wherever you want to go. If you're wondering how you get an IP address when you connect to your home network, the answer is Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. DHCP runs on UDP ports 67 and 68. DHCP is a client-server protocol that assigns IP addresses depending on how the DHCP server is configured. Secure Shell, or SSH, is a protocol used to remotely access computers on a secure channel. SSH runs on TCP port 22. Telnet runs on TCP port 23. Telnet is also a way to remotely access computers. However, due to its traffic being unencrypted, it isn't utilized as much. Unencrypted means that everything going over the wire is readable if someone were to be listening. File Transfer Protocol, or FTP, runs on TCP port 21. This is one of those moments where I say knowing the difference between TCP and UDP is very important. If you're missing any parts of a file, TCP will recover those unlike UDP, hence why TCP is more superior when it comes to important files. Let's cover what we've gone over today. What the internet is, the OSI model, how the OSI model works, networking equipment, and common protocols. Networking is my favorite subject. It's so in-depth and I find it so interesting as to how there's so many things to learn. In the next chapter, we're going to be taking a look at how to use Task Manager and how to manage your programs on your system. Till the next episode.